Hi, I'm John Doyle. You might know me as the YouTube man who hosts the Heck Off Kami program that so many of us enjoy, but really, I'm just a normal guy like you. I have dreams, fears. I've struck out and cost my team the big game before. Sometimes I sing in the car. And like all good people, I can be labeled and charted on arbitrary graphs which are produced by vague and loaded questions, so I hope that you'll stay tuned as we take the political compass test together. Let's get started. John Doyle in Heck Off, Kami. I'm very excited to do this for a couple reasons. Firstly, this video actually is a test for YouTube because the title of the video has my name in it. So what this is going to do is tell us if when you search John Doyle on YouTube, all the videos made by the people calling me a Nazi, those come up first because my name is in the title or because that's the perception of me that YouTube wants people to have. So theoretically, if it's just because my name is in the title, this video should go right up there with them, but only time will tell. Can't say I'm too optimistic. And also because I've noticed that you know, conservatives, we like to hold ourselves in high regard, like, oh, these leftists get so triggered by ideas, how pathetic, but then I come out and say, hey, you know, we should probably regulate porn or something, and then I get death threats from my wonderful audience, so I'm excited to put this out here, find out where we agree, find out where we don't, and then move forward from there. So, the last time I took this test, I believe I was a sophomore in high school, and I remember that all of the questions were very vague, and many of them were predicated upon false premises. So I'll walk you through sort of how I'm interpreting all of these as we go through them. But the way it works is that it tries to graph you along two axes, one for left versus right and one for authoritarian versus libertarian. And I'm not the biggest fan of this model, but I do understand the reasoning behind it. Um, my prediction is that I'll be somewhere in the blue, which is where conservatives will end up if it's accurate. I highly doubt that I'll be in the purple, which is where the libertarians would be. I am a conservative, not a libertarian, but I used to be a libertarian. And obviously there's some overlap, but I'll let you guys be the, the arbiters of that. So we'll get to it. So the first question, if economic globalization is inevitable, it should primarily serve humanity rather than the interests of transnational corporations. This is kind of what I was talking about. I don't like the questions. I wish that they made them more explicit and specific. Like, I think that would make for a much more accurate test, but, you know, I'm not going to be this guy about it. Like, I'll just, I'll take the test. Um, the first thing, economic globalization is not actually inevitable. It's often purported to be this inevitable consequence of societal evolution. It's the culmination of technological and industrial development, etc. This is just not the case when we talk about modern economic globalization. That was the direct result of the deliberate creation of certain institutions and policies with specific agendas in mind. And like we can weigh the pros and cons of that at a later time, but you know, I guess if the premise is like if it's inevitable, so okay, if it's inevitable, it should primarily serve the interests of humans over transnational corporations. That's also tricky because corporations are just like abstract legal entities. So human beings comprise corporations. Corporations are just people. So I don't think these two are mutually exclusive. You know, as our friends on the left would say, it's not binary, but you know, I guess that's why they say primarily. So, so yeah, okay, primarily I'd say that I agree with that because to primarily serve the interests of humanity is in effect to serve the interests of corporations because corporations can be extremely helpful to humanity, but to primarily serve the interests of corporations isn't necessarily to serve the interests of humanity. And people will respond to that by saying, Oh, well, corporations can only benefit through voluntary transactions in the free markets. Yeah, I know, I know, I know who Milton Friedman is. But, you know, to serve the interests of corporations is, like, in isolation. That leads to things like monopolies. I mean, those are beneficial to corporations, like, by definition. That's why you look at who lobbies for regulations to crush small businesses. You look at who tries to use antitrust laws to break up justly earned market shares. It's businesses trying to serve their own interests. Like, a business only has an incentive to make money. That can mean voluntary transactions where everyone's happy, or that can mean getting the population addicted to or dependent upon a product that only it sells and then, you know, jacking up the prices. Like, those are both beneficial to corporations. You can't just assume that businesses always have um, the best interests of people at heart. And so what we have to do is try to have a system that facilitates their success if it benefits people. And this would mean keeping big, big businesses, excuse me, from lobbying for regulations that kill smaller competition, basically things like tremendous deregulation of different markets. But we also have to acknowledge the importance of not allowing certain things to be marketed. Like you're selling homemade hair conditioner made from pumpkin seed oil uh, out of your house from an online store, which enables you to pay for your daughter's soccer season. Like that's epic. Step aside, Uncle Sam. But you want to sell heroin in my neighborhood? You want to get my sons more interested in pornography than bike rides? so you can profit off ad revenue? Yeah, I don't think so. Not in my neighborhood. So I'll just say that I agree. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to, to overthink everything, if we could just answer the questions? But of course, we always have to overthink, but uh, I'll try to be more expeditious. 
I'd always support my country whether it was right or wrong. True, strongly agree. I'd always support my country. I love my country. And that doesn't mean I love the government of my country. The government of my country is dumb. They only know like six things and at least four of them aren't even true. My country is you, it's my family, my forefathers, my land. This land was made for me and you. You know, we talk about supporting something. I believe that like literally means to support it, to do your best to prevent it from collapsing. Like if your friend wanted you to go with them to a party in a dangerous neighborhood and you said no, you get a call from them they're like hey you were right they're playing russian roulette with a glock and a six-sided die can you come get me you might want to say i told you so but at the end of the day you want what's best for your friend so you go and you pick them up and you scold them after the fact after they're no longer in danger so the way i interpret this is like yes i'll always support my country in that i will always love my country and i will always do my best to keep her on the right track basically so yes no one chooses his or her country of birth, so it's foolish to be proud of it. Strongly disagree. That's like saying, there's no reason to be proud of your parents. You didn't choose to be their child. Now, it would be weird and like pretty narcissistic to just be proud of your country exclusively or primarily because you were born there. But in my case, I happen to have been born in a country that frankly is worth being proud of more so than all other countries, I would say. But that doesn't mean that other people shouldn't also be proud of their countries. I love it. I really do. Like when people are proud of their countries, it truly brings me happiness to see like British people taking pride in Brexit, for example. I really like that. You know, unless your country sucks, then you probably shouldn't be proud of it. But, you know. Our race has many superior qualities compared with other races. This is interesting because they say our race, which implies that the author of this test and I are undoubtedly of the same race. And the only way to ensure that would be to define race as the human race. And I do believe that the human race is superior to all other species because typically when we say the human race, we really mean the human species. And of course, I am team human every day, but I'm more inclined to think that this is the standard issue, are you a Nazi question, which I'm not, but also... As a Christian, I disagree with the premise for we are all one in Jesus Christ. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Disagree. If the enemy of your enemy were your friend, he'd explicitly be your friend. You know, oftentimes people can work together for a time united by their dislike for something or someone. But if that relationship was conceived by your mutual dislike for whatever that thing is, what's to stop that relationship from dissolving or becoming hostile after that thing is taken care of? Like the foundation of a friendship is much more stable than that. But, you know, I also understand the short term strategy behind it. So I'll just disagree. Military action that defies international law is sometimes justified. True. Strongly agree. Of course, we can always come up with a reason for something to be justified, but international law is basically fake. And I am seriously of the opinion that I possess more actualized brain power after a small black coffee than the entire United Nations General Assembly. There is now a worrying fusion of information and entertainment. If the question were just there is a worrying fusion of information and entertainment, I might be inclined to just agree, but it specifies now which isn't true. I mean, fusing information and entertainment is something that human beings have always done. Some of the best works of literature, for example, do exactly this. My personal favorite being Animal Farm by George Orwell, which of course is a critique of Stalinist Russia, but it's about little farm animals, so it's fun. But this seems to be pretty innate to human nature. Um, so the solution to me would just be to get more conservatives involved in entertainment so we could chip away at the left's monopoly. People are ultimately divided more by class than by nationality. Strongly disagree. The 20th century basically owned that hypothesis with facts and logic, which is partially what led to the left embracing racial and sexual identity politics as a political strategy. The original hypothesis basically failed. Some men tried to update the software, notably Lenin. Mao is a good example, but that failed. So no, people are not more divided by class than by nationality. Controlling inflation is more important than controlling unemployment. Strongly agree. The backbone of an economy is its monetary policy. Like if you look at what's caused the recessions and depressions of the past, it can often be traced back to bad monetary policy. And the way that you would go about controlling unemployment would be to have the government create jobs through things like public works projects. Um, but the problem with that is that the sustainability of something like that is basically still dependent on the monetary policy. So that's going to end up taking precedence. Uh, because corporations cannot be trusted to voluntarily protect the environment, they require regulation. Yeah, you know, you need to account for externalities, but this is not meant to shoehorn in like a Green New Deal, which goes way beyond that by basically any metric. So we'll just agree. From each according to his ability to each according to his need is a fundamentally good idea. Yeah, I mean, it sure sounds like a good idea. When I think of an idea being good or bad. You gotta think like, why does it even exist? And the ideas exist to solve problems. So because of that, the idea should be evaluated on how well it's actually going to solve that problem. The left doesn't do that. The left evaluates ideas based on how good they sound, like in a moral context. This particular idea sounds like a good idea, meaning it sounds like a virtuous idea, but it doesn't actually work in practice. And it costs us tens of millions of human lives to figure that out, but you know that's not quite enough for them yet, or so it would seem. 
It's a sad reflection on society that something as basic as drinking water is now a bottled, branded consumer product. No, it's a sad reflection on society that people can like make statements like that as if they're like very insightful. Like, wow, that's deep, man. Why are we paying for something that we can get for free? Let me just go get my funnel and my jug from my car and we can just wait for three hours instead of going into the convenience store and paying 99 cents. Like, what else would it be? It's a resource. It's scarce. We need it. Like, why not sell it? You still buy your water from the government. Do you think that's what all of us should do? No, thank you. I don't want the fluoride stare. Okay, relax, relax. Land shouldn't be a commodity to be bought and sold. It's like the same thing, as opposed to what? The government distributing it as they see fit? That is incorrect on at least a practical and a philosophical level. It is regrettable that many personal fortunes are made by people who simply manipulate money and contribute nothing to society. So this question was obviously written by someone who has never taken a second to try to comprehend how the financial services industry works. Like it's not just pushing numbers on a screen and you know, watching it light up, yay, colors. No, and even if that were the case, why is that regrettable? Like wh why would we regret that? This seems like an odd way to put it, but you know, that being said, there are people within the industry that exploit the society to benefit themselves, which is doing more than just the hypothetical not contributing to it. So, so we'll disagree. Protectionism is sometimes necessary in trade. Strongly agree. We're not going to let our country be taken advantage of anymore. I mean, protectionism is like 34% of what won Donald Trump the election in 2016. And both the right and the left have their own different reasons for supporting free trade. All of them are misguided. Seriously, here's something you don't hear too often. There is nothing conservative about supporting free trade. The founder of the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln, was a protectionist. And his three pals alongside him on Mount Rushmore, Washington, Jefferson, and Roosevelt, they were all protectionists as well. Jefferson, you know, he came around after the War of 1812. Good for for him. He got there. Alexander Hamilton, who was George Washington's treasurer and who sits nicely on the $10 bill, he was a protectionist. This idea that, you know, wide open cowboy capitalism, free trade is the American way. It's just not true. It's not real history. The second piece of legislation that George Washington signed into law after independence was literally a tariff. If you want to hollow out American towns and keep our supply lines dependent on foreign countries who are often hostile towards us, vote for free trade. But be careful. If a viral pandemic breaks out, you might be in hot water, but it's unlikely, right? It's not like they eat notoriously diseased animals like you and I eat apple pie or anything, so you should be fine. But yeah, if you want to uh, put American families first, vote for protectionism. The only social responsibility of a company should be to deliver a profit to its shareholders. I don't know if you could even call that a, a social responsibility. That I feel as though that's more of like a structural obligation, so I don't really like the premise, so I'll disagree, but... It's important to note that just because you're a businessman, that doesn't mean you're no longer an American. Like you're still, you have an obligation to your countrymen, so you shouldn't practice unethical business. The rich are too highly taxed. True, everyone's too highly taxed. The rich are a part of everyone, therefore, this is true, so I strongly agree. The rich basically pay for everything, but the thing is that the things that they're paying for shouldn't be being paid for. We don't need them. Spending should be drastically cut along with taxes. I want to comparatively debilitate the government. Those with the ability to pay should have access to higher standards of medical care. Yes, but that's not because they're wealthy and therefore better than you. It's because the system should like the system should have mobility to ensure that it functions efficiently. It would be better to have a system where the only thing keeping you from getting good medical care is money instead of a system where the only thing keeping you from getting good medical care is that good medical care doesn't exist anymore, that it's no longer accessible without a series of obstacles that are trying to have the same effect that the price system used to have, except they're worse at it and they serve no practical purpose. Governments should penalize businesses that mislead the public. Uh, it depends on what you mean by mislead, but yeah, yeah you know, I, I agree with that. A genuine free market requires restrictions on the ability of predator multinationals to create monopolies. Historically speaking, the monopolies that were taught to demonize, whether it's Rockefeller, Carnegie, even Bill Gates, they weren't actually monopolies. And it was actually the companies that they were crushing simply by being better than they were. Those companies were lobbying to get the government involved to like break up uh, their market share. So I, I disagree with that. The freer the market, the freer the people. Generally true. I agree with that. But, you know, obviously we have to have some regulation, right? Like we don't want people selling harmful products. So, well, but the market would punish them for doing it. Okay. If my daughter eats a candy bar that turns out to cause blindness, I really could not care less if their second quarter looks iffy. I would prefer that she could see. Also, we don't want companies to easily profit off addiction. This is why we regulate tobacco, alcohol. This is why we should regulate pornography. Because if you're a slave to your desires, are you really free? Of course not. But, you know, when it comes to the general allocation of resources, the free market is, of course, second to none. So, yes. Abortion when the woman's life is not threatened should always be illegal. Strongly agree. All authority should be questioned. I disagree with this. I recognize the importance of 
like being skeptical of authority. I myself am very skeptical of authority, but there's also an aspect of trust that I think is important because if you're not willing to demonstrate that at least some of the time, then no real progress can ever be made. And this question asks if all authority should be questioned, which I'm assuming means like any authority at any time. So I would have to say that that is not always the case. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If this is meant to mean that the punishment should fit the crime, then I do agree with that. Uh, taxpayers should not be expected to prop up any theaters or museums that cannot survive on a commercial basis. I disagree. I disagree. I think that practically speaking, if we're going to talk about wasting taxpayer dollars, the museums and the theaters are not where we should be directing our efforts. Um, but even on principle, I think that there's great value in preserving certain cultural and historical landmarks or staples. So. Schools should not make classroom attendance compulsory. Strongly disagree. This is specifically asking if it should be the policy of the school, not necessarily the government. So should a school that you're enrolled in require that you show up? Yeah. Yeah. Like if their academic model doesn't assume that a classroom is a full capacity or even that the capacity will fluctuate, I don't think that they would be able to allocate their resources effectively. Like if 30 kids are supposed to show up and we plan for that, two are missing. Okay, whatever. That's a lot different than if anywhere between one and 30 kids are supposed to show up, we try to plan for that. Like it would be very improbable that we could do that efficiently and sustainably. Like just, just go to school. It doesn't mean it has to be a government school. Preferably we just do away with government schools, but you know, it's like, you should be in school and, and that school should require your attendance. That's, that's just my, my two cents. All people have their rights, but it's better for us that different sorts of people should keep to their own kind. The problem with this is that there are virtually infinite ways that you could categorize people. So the logical conclusion of this would be all of us like separated living in the pods. And I don't like that. So disagree. Good parents sometimes have to spank their children. Disagree. I don't think that spanking your children is I don't think it's the end of the world, but I don't think it's an effective form of punishment. The counter argument is always, oh, well, my parents spanked me and I turned out just fine. Yeah, no one's saying that that's not possible, but it's much more effective to actually acknowledge the capacity that children have for rational thought, even at very young ages, and then work from that. Unfortunately, physically disciplining children is quite often like a lazy reaction. You're not actually teaching them that what they did was wrong. You're just teaching them that if you find out about them doing that, you're going to hurt them. So instead of them learning uh, that they shouldn't do that thing, they've learned that they should keep things from you. And then they've learned that hurting people is a good way to get what you want. So this is how young minds develop. So it's important to treat them as rational, intelligent young people. It's natural for children to keep some secrets from their parents. I mean, yeah, it's probably natural, but that doesn't mean that it's a good idea for them to do it. Uh, and, and the probability of this happening is going to decrease if the child feels as if he or she can trust the parents and also if the parent has done well at keeping the child uninterested in things that would even you know, be considered bad in the first place. So possessing marijuana for personal use should not be a criminal offense. Very slightly agree, but only because that's not the hill that I want to die on right now. There are more pressing things that need to be dealt with at the moment. Frankly, I don't really care, but I'm inclined to push back because so many potheads think that marijuana is not only harmless, but actually like beneficial. And some of them even purport it to be like this miracle drug. And it's all very annoying and incorrect. The prime function of schooling should be to equip the future generation to find jobs. Strongly disagree. There's more to school than becoming a cog in the wheel. Now, that being said, of course, schools should certainly teach students more practical skills. Like that would be epic, but there's more to education and life than just doing a job. Like school should teach you to think critically, which by the way means that when you hear something, you think of every possible way that it might not be true. And you keep just running trials like that until the idea is either garbage or sound. They never actually like teach you that in school. They say, think critically, but they never actually tell you what that means. If school were just to help you get a job, uh, then you wouldn't necessarily need things like that. You could just skate by through just learning how to snap electronics together or something. People with serious inheritable disabilities should not be allowed to reproduce. Strongly disagree. The most important thing for children to learn is to accept discipline. Strongly disagree. The most important thing for children to learn is to be moral and rational individuals. There are no savage and civilized peoples. There are only different cultures. I strongly disagree. Some cultures suck. And if you disagree, you should throw a dart at a map of the world minus the West, then travel to wherever it sticks, and then write your, your HuffPo op-ed about why all cultures are equal. Those who are able to work and refuse the opportunity should not expect society support. True, you are not entitled to my labor. You have your own labor. If you choose not to use it, you know, that's your fault. Laziness should not be rewarded by becoming an occupation. When you are troubled, it's better not to think about it, but to keep busy with more cheerful things. I disagree. I think that uh, there's merit to thinking about whatever is troubling you. I mean, obviously, at some point, you're going to have to move on, but you need to analyze it, learn from it, and go from there instead of just ignoring it and hoping that it goes away. 
First-generation immigrants can never be fully integrated within their new country. Okay, well, it says never, which I don't think is true, so I'll have to disagree, but I do think that immigration policy should require likelihood of assimilation as a factor. This means a meritocracy. This means learning English. This means supporting our constitution because what we've been doing for the last few decades now is basically letting people pour across the border and expecting very little in terms of assimilation because it's offensive and there's no such thing as American culture, just other cultures that exist in America. Or at least that's what we've been told. What's good for the most successful corporations is always ultimately good for all of us. The question says always, which is definitely not true. And we talked about some of the reasons why this could be earlier. So no broadcasting institution, however independent its content, should receive public funding. I disagree. I think that certain things should be covered by a public outlet. And also this kind of goes back to the question of like, okay, is this where we're going to attack spending? on like, what, NPR? What about Social Security? You know? Our civil liberties are being excessively curbed in the name of counterterrorism. Mm, I don't think that's true. A significant advantage of a one-party state is that it avoids all of the arguments that delay progress in a democratic political system. I mean, I guess. I don't know if I'd call that an advantage because, like, sure, your policy might be able to get through quicker, but I think there's some benefit to arguing about the policy and going through the process trying to make it, like, airtight. So I disagree with that. Getting bad policy through but doing it faster isn't really an advantage, I don't think. Although the electronic age makes official surveillance easier, only wrongdoers need to be worried. No, this is ridiculous. Whether you're guilty is irrelevant to the question of whether your rights can be violated. The death penalty should be an option for the most serious crimes. True. Justice for the victim of the crime, punishment for the perpetrator, deterrence for those considering crimes of similar caliber, even rehabilitation for the perpetrator. I think an argument could be made that your spirit is rehabilitated in your final moments. I hate lethal injection, though. I would bring back the firing squad, literally just because I think it's more dignified. I would much rather go out on my feet T-posing than being strapped down and injected with the forever nap juice like an animal. I think it's disgusting, even for our most vile offenders, frankly. In a civilized society, one must always have people above to be obeyed and people below to be commanded. Yes, that is one of the defining features of conservatism. We believe in hierarchy. Uh, abstract art that doesn't represent anything should not be considered art at all. Absolutely true. Abstract art literally exists to have no purpose. Like, its purpose is that it doesn't have one. That's what it's trying to communicate. Like, of course, it can be aesthetically pleasing, but that does not make it art. Abstract art literally exists to say that anything can be art because it's all subjective, which is why its popularity coincides with subjectivist culture. And it's also why it's so popular among these educated leftists on the coasts. In criminal justice, punishment should be more important than rehabilitation. True, because justice for the victim is more important than rehabilitation for the criminal. Also, because deterrence is important. It is a waste of time to try to rehabilitate some criminals. Yeah, this is saying that some people simply cannot be rehabilitated. I agree with that. We know that to be true, actually. The business person and the manufacturer are more important than the writer and the artist. Strongly disagree with that. How are we defining important? And oftentimes the writer and the artist can also be the business person and the manufacturer, right? So I wouldn't say that they're more important. I think that they're all important in the roles that they play um, in the big picture. Mothers may have careers, but their first duty is to be homemakers. True. Mothers, we love you. We cherish you. You don't have the hardest job in the world, but you do have the most important job in the world by far. Without you, nothing else matters. I mean, fathers are not mothers and fathers are extremely important, which is something that we talk about quite often on this channel. But at the end of the day, no society can survive without mothers raising children. Chesterton had a great way of explaining it. Basically that feminism has convinced women that it's oppressive to serve their families, but it's actually empowering to serve their bosses. This idea that it's empowering to outsource the nurturing of your child to someone else while you go punch numbers into an Excel file. Like, come on, give me a break. A mother's first duty is to her family, just as a father's first duty is to his family. But the job descriptions are different. And pretending that they aren't has made us into a depressed, lonely country with no family structure, basically begging for the Chinese to come conquer us. So, multinational companies are unethically exploiting the plant genetic resources of developing countries. I am suspect of their use of unethically and exploiting, so I disagree with that. Making peace with the establishment is an important aspect of maturity. I generally agree with that. Of course, it depends on which establishment you're talking about, but I do think that it's important to accept that some things just are certain ways and, you know, it's best to try to live your life in accordance with that instead of just fighting against it. A great example uh, would be your gender. Astrology accurately explains many things. No, and the people that believe this stuff have given me the most headaches per capita of any group of people. You cannot be moral without being religious. True, you cannot be moral without being religious. You could be moral by happenstance, but without any grounding, it would have no significance. For example, to be a moral person in the United States, let's go back 50 years because the standards have changed because of the decline in religion. 
you would subscribe to Christian morality. You yourself might not be a Christian, but for your morality to make sense, it would have to be grounded in something that would have the authority to do that, which would be God. It's not at all a coincidence that this country's morality has declined alongside its religious affiliation and participation. And most people that think that they're not religious are actually very religious. You know, if you ask them uh, how they think the world works, what they think about existence, what they think about good and evil, and how they work in the world. What I've found with myself and with talking to people in similar situations, a lot of people just don't like to be told what to do or what to believe. And so they get a bad taste in their mouth from religious people. But I've yet to meet someone in that position who seriously reads theology and walks away unconvinced. And of course, that's anecdotal, but you know, to be moral means to be in alignment with what is good. And the only being that would have the authority to decide that for all of humanity would be their creator, which is God. Anything else is subjective and, and does not work. Charity is better than social security as a means of helping the genuinely disadvantaged. This is true not only because it's more efficient, but because charity requires a level of locality and reciprocity that social security and government has never tried to match, uh, nor could it. Some people are naturally unlucky. Yeah, you know, I guess that's true. You could be not born in America. It is important that my child's school instills religious values. Very true. This gets back to the same thing. Like people are so afraid of their children being taught the Bible in school, despite that it's literally the most influential book in the history of the world. It provides the foundation for the greatest society in the history of the world. It's like, why are you okay with your children being taught the books of Marx and Freud, but not the books of John or Matthew? Like they're going to be taught religion in schools regardless, but it'll just be self-worship. Oh, you're perfect. Just how you are. You can be any gender that you'd like. You know, if that's okay with you, good luck. Kids aren't coming to my kid's birthday party. We were going to go bowling too. So now your kid doesn't get to sign my kid's bowling pin souvenir, nor does he get to enjoy two slices of pepperoni pizza and eight ounces of watered down Pepsi because you decided to raise a little Marxist. There goes your number one dad mug. Sex outside marriage is usually immoral. True. A same-sex couple in a stable, loving relationship should not be excluded from the possibility of child adoption. Excluded in comparison to who? Children have a right to a mother and a father. The waiting list of married men and women waiting to adopt babies is miles long, even for babies with special needs. And that's not to say that they're less valid. It's just to say that a lot of couples aren't prepared for the extra responsibility. So given that, there are circumstances that would exclude them. So, you know, children should have a mother and a father. And having two mothers or two fathers is literally impossible. So it would be the best scenario for the child to be given to a married man and a married woman who can use their complementary strengths to play their separate roles in raising the child. Pornography depicting consenting adults should be legal for the adult population. Here we go, boys. Why? I would first like to state that if you are pro-pornography, you would not have fit into the conservative movement during the days of like the George Bush administration, frankly. What I assume happened is the internet moved into everyone's pocket, the online pornography industry exploded, and it gives its product away for free. Because as the saying goes, if it's free, then you're the product. So let's think about this. What decides if something should be legal? Well, first of all, if I have a right to it, banning it is out of the question. So do we have a right to pornography? No. No, if you think the First Amendment of the Constitution, which reads that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, etc. If you think that James Madison wrote that so that you could watch people have sex and do a lot weirder stuff after that, uh, you know, after you desensitize yourself, which you will, you are literally beyond reason. Like the founding fathers probably would have shot you for suggesting that. The Supreme Court has already ruled that obscenity can be regulated. It has to meet three standards. Basically, it has to be explicitly sexual, such as, you know, people having sex on camera. It has to portray that in a patently offensive manner, and it has to lack serious literary artistic, political, or scientific value. And the argument I always hear, well, but what happens if the left gets power and decides that conservatives are obscene with their beliefs and then they censor us? Okay, do you understand that in order to do that, as outlined by the Supreme Court, they would have to prove to an average person that conservative beliefs meet all three prongs for the definition of obscene, which means they would have to prove that conservative beliefs are designed to make people horny. Do you understand how absolutely drained of intelligence that idea is? Like, do you know how stupid that is? You don't actually believe that. You don't. Like, you just, you want to believe that because you think it's cool to say that, oh yeah, government's always bad no matter what. It makes it really easy for you to be involved in politics because your answer is always just, oh, government's bad. <laughs> and you get to feel like, you know, you really know something. Yeah, you know something that we don't. This is why I'm not a libertarian. You want to know what did it? I noticed that I was consciously trying to rework my beliefs because I thought that, oh, it'd be cool to be a libertarian. Yeah, government's bad. I'm smarter than all the people who think government should exist for things. But then I realized libertarianism only like details in abstractions. Like the focal point of libertarian philosophy is the non-aggression principle. Do whatever you want, long as you're not using force against your neighbor or imposing your will on other people. Like that's, that's why they think people should be able to own recreational nukes. Like, okay, what if someone uses one? Well, that would be a violation of the NAP. Okay, well, what if they do it anyway? Well, they wouldn't because that would be a violation of the NAP. And then this goes back and forth eternally until we're all dead. Same thing with pornography. You don't have a right to it. We know that. 
We know that it's one of the biggest causes of divorce in this country. We know that it's prematurely sexualizing children. They're being exposed to it at age 11 on average, which means half of them are younger when they're first exposed to it. We know that prematurely sexualizing children causes an increased likelihood of depression, anxiety, dangerous behavior, relationship problems. It drains motivation from men. It makes them depressed. They're all addicted to it. Okay, that's what I've got. And then you want to tell me that none of that matters because, because what? Because be, you don't have a right. Like it does nothing positive for you. No one's saying you can't masturbate. Like have a heyday, dude. But like, you won't do it without porn because you're addicted to the dopamine. I mean, libertarianism says that this is all okay it's because it's better than the government doing something. Why? No one cares to answer because all that matters is that the government's always bad. The only way that you're going to get the culture off pornography when it's addicted to it is like to make it go away. So that's what should be done. And if you think otherwise, even though it's inarguably a terrible thing for society, I would imagine that it's because you're selfish because you're trying to feed your own addiction at the expense of children and families. And I hate that. What goes on in a private bedroom between consenting adults is no business of the state. I mean, it depends on what's going on. Like, if there's abuse going on, then it probably is. So I don't know if I'd say it's no business, but uh, it's definitely not the role of the state to try to catch you cheating on your wife or something like that. No one can feel naturally homosexual. I disagree with that. This doesn't negate the environmental factors that can influence the manifestation of it. Scientists have basically failed at establishing a gay gene, but there are things like prenatal hormone exposure that play a role. But ultimately, regardless of the cause of homosexuality, it still feels natural to the person, even if its manifestation wasn't. So these days, openness about sex has gone too far. Hmm. I wonder what I will say. All right. Let's see where I ended up. Can I get a drum roll? Yeah, okay, that's about what I expected. It's funny because everyone that hates me, they always, oh, he's a Nazi, he's far right, or he's a fascist. But as you can see, I'm not that far right. I'm not a libertarian because I'm a conservative, but I'm still nowhere close to being a Nazi. But that's the next video that they're gonna do about me. John Doyle is unsurprisingly only eight points away from being a Nazi on a graph with 10 points. Oh, well, this was fun. It was very epic. Um, Joe Biden actually just attacked you in a tweet. I don't know if you have seen it. He just what? Attacked you. He just said. Well, he didn't write anything. Look, he has people, he has professionals from the Democrats. Mr. President, let me just read what he said. He said Donald Trump is not responsible for the coronavirus, but he is responsible for failing to prepare our nation to respond to it. How do you respond okay. to that, sir? Uh, he didn't write that. That was done by a Democrat operative. He doesn't write. He doesn't. He's probably not even watching right now. Uh, and if he is, he doesn't understand what he's watching. But just so you understand, it was very nice what they wrote out. I don't know. You know, they released it at a strange time. You know, sort of a strange time to release something like that. 